students, welcome to chapter four. It is so nice to have you here. Okay, chapter four, networking and cloud. Actually, this is just networking. Uh, actually, for cloud, go back and review from last week, because I, I put on the end of last week's, I put quite a bit on cloud in there. Uh, so just do that. So I'm just going to cover some networking stuff this week. Here again, we're going down a little deeper layer than some things that, that's in the uh, syllabus uh, PowerPoints. So networking, that's what I, and I like this saying, I made it up. I'm original. I made this up. Keep it simple or keep IT simple. You get it? Did you get it? No? Okay. All right. But yeah, keep it simple. Keeping IT simple. Why do I, I like that topic? Because many times with all the terminology and the buzzwords, you name it, you know, it seems like it's such a complicated thing. But let me tell you, I am a person who firmly believes, I stand by this with all my heart, that there is nothing hard, nothing difficult in this world. Things that always appear to be complex are really just a combination of a lot of simple things put together. We used to have a saying in the Air Force, our, our supply guys when I was in the Air Force, and they said, you know, if you look at an at a F-16 or F-15, all that is is a lot of parts flying together in really tight formation. And, you know, and they're actually correct. You know, it's a lot of simple parts, thousands of them, that are just kind of stuck together, flying together in a very tight formation. So even though the airplane itself may look to be very complicated, but when you break it down to its piece parts, no, just simple parts. Uh, now, so that's why I say it may look a little, network sometimes seems overwhelming, but it, it's not. As a matter of fact, and I'm going to do this later on this, in this presentation, I, I have an analogy that I use for networking that I compare it to our U.S. postal system. That's right, USPS. We'll get there. But first, we're going to talk about uh, model. And, and I touched on this briefly last week in the intro uh, about uh, the OSI, the Open System Interconnection. Uh, if you remember this from, from last week, so I'm kind of tying this together. It is a great segue. Just kind of slide right into from one week to the next. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to now go a little deeper into each of those layers. Why? Because this is a good model to help you understand uh, the networking from the top down or from the bottom up, whichever way you want to cover it. So we're going to start with the upper four layers. And if you, oh, let's go back for a second. Let's talk about each layer real quick. I said there was seven layers in the model that we're going to use. It's the app, uh, application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and the physical layer. So we're going to break each of these layers down. I'm going to go a little deeper this week in each one. So I'm going to start with the upper four layers. The upper four layers, which is the application, presentation, session, and transport. All right. So application layer. Uh, whenever I teach this, whenever I say application layer, most people's minds automatically go to Microsoft Office and Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Outlook. Well, this is not the applications that we're talking about here. Uh, th 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 those are user applications, okay? The application layer we're talking about lies right up underneath user op uh, application. And these, these um, protocols that we're talking about, they're actually in, embedded in your operating system. So if you have a, a Windows 10 or uh, if you're running Linux or if you're running any other type of uh, Mac OS, these are in the operating system, not within the uh, user application itself. So what is a, a um, protocol that, uh, that operates at this layer? Well, we're going to talk about some of these. Uh, and I'm really going to use them as examples because uh, what we're talking about here are APIs or application programming interfaces that interfaces uh, the user application with the, to, and then start to get it ready to put on the network layer. For instance, let me give you an example. Give you an example. Microsoft Word, okay? If I told you today that Microsoft Word could not print, you'd probably say, what you talking about, Willis? Well, no, it doesn't. What Microsoft Word does as a user application, it actually talks to a protocol called, you know, uh, line print daemon within the operating system at layer seven that actually does the printing. So when you hit control P or you go up and hit print, what you're doing is telling, going through Microsoft Word to 
Windows, let's say Windows 10, and you're telling that line print daemon that, okay, I'm ready to go print. Same thing if you want to go to the Internet. Um, Microsoft Edge or Internet Explorer cannot get to the Internet. Now, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP, or the secure version, HTTPS, Yes, it can, because that is the protocol that is at the application layer that actually uh, interfaces between Internet Explorer and the other layers that get you to the Internet. So HTTP is what tells, uh, that gets you there, not Internet Explorer specifically. Uh, so, so that's how, the, uh, that's what the application layer does. Uh, so, so just a big takeaway here is don't confuse those with your user applications. So now that, um, let's say, you know, we're, we're going to send an email because email is the same way. You email. Let's say if you're using uh, Microsoft um, Outlook. Well, the API that sends mail, I think you got the, you see the, the, the rhythm now. It isn't all Outlook. It is SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. That's what... Outlook talks to, that's the protocol that is used to actually go and get your mail ready to be sent down the line. And when we think of the word protocol, because I'm going to use this word a lot, what is a protocol? All it is is a, a way of communicating, protocol. For instance, you pick up your phone and you want to call someone. You dial their number. You dial, if they're in the United States, you dial a one, then you dial the area code. And 972, and then you dial the prefix 544, and then you dial the exchange that they're on, 3378. That is the protocol for making a phone call. If you try to do it a different way, it doesn't really work. Now, what you can have is speed dial, right? Well, speed dial, does speed dial do anything different? All speed dial does is speed up the process, but it still has to talk to the protocol that a uh, digital switch understands. So that's what a protocol is. It's a way of communicating. We do it with English language. We do it with whatever. The English language, English language, if I could speak it myself today, it has a protocol. You know, subject, verb, uh, you know, preposition, all those things make the protocol of how we're able to communicate. So that's why we said protocol, that's what we're talking about. So now we're going to send an email, right? So I got my email put together in Outlook, and I'm going to hit send. When I hit send, the application, the API, application program interface tells SMTP protocol, the uh, simple mail transfer protocol, to Okay, get, take this, prepare it, get it ready to go down the line. All right, so that takes us to layer six, layer six, layer six, the presentation layer. Now, like I said, what the presentation layer does, it takes the information or the data that came from layer seven and it formats it. And if we want to do encryption, it does that at this layer also. And it prepares it to be sent across the network. So, and, and what it does, it helps us out with compatibility issues. Now, some of the, the, the protocols you may see at this layer is things like ASCII or uh, JPEG or MPEG if you send in movies. MIDI, for instance, example, I, you know, I, I do MIDI music. So when I connect my keyboard to my computer, my computer recognizes that that is a MIDI device, and now it is able to uh, format the, the, the information coming off of that as a MIDI file, or I can save a file as MIDI, and then when I, I can send it to someone else, and they can take that MIDI and open it up, and it will play through their keyboard or through their computer. So that's what layer six does. It, it's, it presents data in a way that makes it compatible. So that's why I can send you a picture, or better yet, that's why you're watching this video right now as a .mov, and you're able to watch it because layer six provided in a way that's compatible and presentable across the internet, or across the network. Okay, layer five is our session layer. This is a layer sometimes is a little difficult to understand, but uh, what this does is this manages and terminates connections between applications uh, and, and, uh, on, on your network. All right, let me give you an example. All right, let's say I have a, a lot of, uh, here, here, here's a small little in-home network. I got a little switch in the middle, I got two computers connected, and these two computers, one of A and B, wants to talk to computer C, and computer C has a printer connected to it. 
Okay, this is this is kind of an old school way of doing it. We, we don't have wireless in this one. This is old school. So now let's say a computer B wants to print, right? So it has to talk through the network to computer C. To, hey, can I use the printer? And computer C, yeah, you can. Well, let's say a computer A wants to send a file or read a file on off of computer C. Same thing. Well, what has to happen is a session has to be set up. So let's say let's use a print example. So if computer B wants to print, use the printer that's connected, that's shared off of computer A, layer five is what establishes that session. So those applications, now the print application can talk to each other, do the handshakes, do everything they need to do so that the information from computer B can be sent via computer A to the printer. So that's layer, that's what the session layer does sets up sessions. Some of the protocols we use there, like your network file system. For instance, if you want to send files across your network, uh, NFS is a file system that allows you to do that to where I can send files from a Linux machine to a Windows machine and or to, uh, to, or to a, uh, uh, a Mac uh, operating system and so that it allows it to be uh, to set up the session to where they can pass information back and forth between each other. Questions? Oh, okay. Didn't hear anything. Okay, so now we take that down to layer four. Layer four is what we call the transport layer. All right, what the transport layer does, it breaks up these 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 this, these datagrams. Because back in the previous uh, layers, for instance, that email that I wanted to send, that I had started layer seven, sent it to layer six, got down to layer, through layer five. Well, that's probably a big package, right? And what this layer does, it says, you know what? I, I, I'm unable to take this and put it all in one big chunk and send it out the internet, or send it out across the network. So what it does, it breaks that email up into chunks, into little portions, and it labels each one of those. It's very similar to uh, how the US mail or UPS. You know, let's say if you ordered something that was really big and a lot of parts to it, and you received it in four boxes because they couldn't physically put them all in one box. So they broke it out, box one or four, box two or four, box three or four, and box four or four. And they put a label on each one. It's got the same identifier so that it knows that all four of these boxes are supposed to get to uh, 1801 Metaview Drive. So now when it shows up and you get three boxes, I got one of four, two of four, and four of four. Hey, where's box three or four? Well, that's when you pick up the phone call UPS, hey, I didn't get a box. And they go, oh, sorry, and resend it. That's what our transport layer does with our data, with our information. So it takes it large, these large data packages, large datagrams, and breaks them up into segments that can be uh, easily, better easily sent uh, down the internet uh, or across a network. And then it also keeps track of the sequencing of those, those, those packets of datagrams uh, and so that way it knows that if one's missing, hey, come back and get another one. Now there's two major protocols that we use at this layer. TCP, what we call Transmission Control Protocol, and UDP, which is User Datagram Pro Pro Protocol. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, TCP is um, assured delivery. UDP is not. And you may ask, well, if it's not a sure delivery, why do we need it? I'll explain to you in a minute. Let's talk about TCP first. And here again, I like to use the mail system. Think about TCP as registered mail, okay? So that if you have, if someone wanted to send you a registered letter, they would have to sign for it and everything. And when it gets to yours, you got to sign for it. So that's a sure delivery. And the person who sent it gets a receipt back, says, yes, this was delivered and, it was, and they've got it. That's a sure delivery. That's how uh, a lot of our structured information across networks are, 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 is, is sent via TCP. For instance, like an email, because you want to be sure that you get the whole message. So think about, we just talked about how it breaks it up into little boxes, right? So let's say that box three or four didn't make it. Well, that's what this protocol does. This protocol goes back up the chain and says, hey, look, we didn't get box uh, segment four or four, and it says resend that. That, and that's why it's called a sure delivery. So when I hit send on my on that email to go out, and from that time, from the time you receive it, that's why there's delay. That's why when we talk about uh, networking, it is not real time. 
because it takes time for all these packets to make it through and then for the read receipts and then it has to resend other packets. Now when he gets to the other end, where the, the person who received the email, your uh, operating system and your application has to put all these packets back together in the right order because they've all been sequenced, sequentially marked at the transport layer. Now, that's TCP, Assured Delivery. UDP does not do that. The User Datagram Protocol, UDP, it is uh, unassured delivery. But we probably use UDP as much or more than TCP. As a matter of fact, you're watching this video right now. This video is being streamed or being pushed to you as UDP um, because there's no, you know, it, it doesn't break it up, into, it doesn't keep up with packets. It's just streaming data straight to you. And if for whatever reason, let's say that this connection breaks or some uh, data or packets get lost, that's when you see videos, you know, starts to pixelate and, and do this. Because UDP doesn't do it, it doesn't go back and say, I missed packet 23 of, of 79, please resend. It's just that packet is gone forever. And for that period of time, there's no video there. So it picks so late like this. So that's what UDP, but we use UDP for a lot of things like streaming music, videos, all of these things is UDP. That's how we get it uh, through, the, through the network. TCP, UDP, all at layer four. Okay, like I said, those are the upper layers. Now we're gonna talk about the bottom three, the bottom three layers. Bottom three layers is layer three, your network, layer two, data leak, layer one, the physical layer. So when we think about layer three, and if you're an IT guy, this is where we you, you live, is in this layer three and down. Uh, some in layer four, but you know, really kind of up the stack, um, not, not as much, because really this is where we start now actually transporting things down the track. Uh, the upper layers was really formatting them to get them ready to be sent. Now these are the ones that actually do the, this is the train, you know, get ready to go down the track. So layer three, uh, that's where we do routing. That's where we do routing. At this layer, that's where we take, <clears throat> we, we find the right path to take, uh, to get uh, information from one place to another. And we do addressing and things of that nature. So packets are created and addressed. And that address, it tells it where it needs to go across the network or across the internet. And what a router is able to do is connect uh, sub-networks together as well. And we use things called the IP address. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, uh, in a couple of slides from now. But if you see, you know, the, the thing and the protocols that we, we use here, uh, IP, actually that's internet protocol. Right now we're in version four, IPv4. Uh, we're moving to IPv version six. Why? Because there's a lot more IP addresses available in version six. You know, you're talking about uh, 128, I mean, two to the 128, as opposed to now we're working with, uh, you know, two to the 32, which is a much, 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 much bigger number and opens up the uh, spectrum quite a bit. And also it helps improve security too as well. But that was, that's probably one of the major protocols. Uh, DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol, that is uh, used quite a bit so that you don't have to type in manually your IP addresses. It will automatically assign IP addresses. Um, so uh, NAT, Network, uh, Address translation is another protocol used there. That's why if you look at your network at home, all your devices have an IP address of 192.168. something, maybe zero or dot one dot whatever. But the IP address coming from your internet service provider is probably a class B or a class A or class B address. You know, it could be 216, 225, 220 uh, type of IP address. NAT is what does that translation. Uh, from a public IP address, like the class A or class B, to a private IP address, class C. Talk about that more. So now we move down the stack to our data link layer. With the data link at this layer, really what it does, it, it, it starts to prepare your data to actually go out. It's going to start converting your, your, these packets, these datagrams, to bits to ones and zeros and to get it ready for the physical layer, layer one. And, and that's uh, where we have switching. You know, switching starts to occur uh, at, at layer two as well. Um, and how we do this is 
through what we call the media access control. And with media access control, or MAC, you may have heard these things, MAC addresses, well, every network device, every computer, every network device that has a networking capability has a media access control number associated with it. And this device, this, this, this switch, is able to recognize that address and it can assign it to a port. So that way it knows that this printer is on this port and this is the, the uh, MAC address. This laptop, I'm gonna connect to this port and it knows this MAC address and so forth and so on. So all the devices connect to this switch because this switch reads, when I plug it in, it reads the MAC address off of the, off of the network card and it stores, its, stores it in its database. And from there, it's able to send information exactly to, to the right place. Now, what this sets up is what we call a LAN. This is a local area network. And we set our LANs up, so now this computer can actually go up, talk to this uh, laptop, or this computer needs to print. It can, you know, it's a, it's a network shared printer, or if I need to store, let's say if this is network attached storage, it also can go up and, and connect there as well, all across a local area network. One of the bigger protocols we use here is Ethernet. You, we, most of us probably, I'm sure, are familiar with that. You've seen those white, blue, or orange cables. Well, not orange is a lot of times is uh, fiber, but you know, blue or white cables. You know, with the RJ45 uh, connector on the back of it. And now that we got here, now we're our, our um, information is changed into the ones and zeros. Like I said, layer two and layer one work really closely together. So now I'm able to either send this out um, over fiber optic or I can send it out, you know, 802.11 across my 4G network or, in, you know, many different ways that now it's able to, to go out from one place to another. This is what your Verizons and your AT&Ts and all, you know, all these big carriers, you know, that is part of that physical layer that we're talking about. Okay, so I, yeah, like I say, I always like describing these last three layers in a uh, analogy that of the United States postal system. So when you think about uh, networking, where do you think it probably came from? Yes, you are hundred percent correct. The U.S. postal system—it was, it was the model that uh, that we used to set up and start doing our. But first, it was switched networks, and then we went to. Uh, packet networks, packet switch. <clears throat> All right, let's look at this model. Now, the way I like to describe this analogy, okay, this is my house, all right, over here. I live in Newport News, Virginia. Well, I really don't. I used to. I really don't anymore. But for the purposes of analogy, okay, I'm on, you know, 121 Lynn. And my grandmother, she lives just around the corner on Patty Street. So I, I love my grandmother, and I want to always communicate with her. So I want to mail her a letter. Now, here's where the analogy starts to come together. When you, if you look at the protocol for mailing a letter in the United States, you have to have a source address and a return address, right? So this is the destination address. This is the source address or the return address, we call it. Now, in networking, we call it... Um, source destination where it originates where it's going and there's a there's a protocol there so I, I address the letter and <clears throat> if I was doing this in a network I would use something called an IP address we talked about briefly earlier now with IPv4 we use 32 32 bits and those 32 bits are broke up, broken up into four individual, what we call octets, okay? Each octet is a part of the IP address. So four octets, and there's eight bits in each octet. So when we do the math, four times eight is 32. So that's where we get 32 bits across. Now, imagine if you want to give somebody your IP address, and you had to say, and they asked you, what's your IP address? And I would say, oh, easy. It's 11000000, 101001, 11110011111. And you probably go, what? What did he just say? Well, that is why, because we as humans, 
No, it was just a little, little dumber sometimes, we think, but we're not, really. Computers are really the dumbest. That's why we use what we call binary coded decimal, so that we as humans can relate and, and, and interact better with each other about networking. So what we do, uh, we take each of these octets and we convert each octet back to decimal. Now, I'm not going to really get into binary to decimal conversions, but if you, you've got questions about that, I can, you know, offline or what I, I've got some other PowerPoint slides we can show you how to do these conversions. But just kind of take my word for it. So this 192, this is the binary equivalent. 168, binary equivalent. 1, binary equivalent. 15. So now this IP address, 192.168.1.15, is much easier for me to tell you what it is than this long string of 32 ones and zeros. But this is what the computer recognizes. This is what we are able to, to how we're able to, to communicate IP addresses. So that's the protocol, you know, just like this is what the US postal system recognizes, this is what your computer recognizes with respect to IP addresses. Now, when we think about IP addresses, there's five classes of categories of IP addresses, class A all the way down to class E. And each one of these are broken out and it tells you how many networks and how many hosts you can have for each one. Not gonna to get too much into those details. Thing to remember, class A and class B, like I say these are really used for commercial networks, the way that, that we've set up IPv4. These are your commercial networks. That's why if you're an internet service provider, that is what they're gonna typically provide to your house is a class A or a class B IP address. Class C, like I said, these are private IP addresses. So these are the ones that we use on the back end of our network address translation. That's why I say in your house, you've got the 192.168.1.15. You go to your neighbor's house, they probably got the exact same, but that's why they don't get confused out there on the internet because why? These are private. They're only seen by your machine or they're only seen by my machine. Uh, class D, like I say, those are reserved for multicast. Multicast is if I want a network and I want to shoot out a message to everybody um, on, the, on the network. And class E's, they are reserved for future use. Okay, so now let's talk about back to my grandma. How do I get this letter to my grandmother? Well, right here in my neighborhood, I have a post office, a local post office right there in Hydenwood, Newport News. So... I send this letter, and now, if you think about this, the little truck, the guy in the truck who came and picked that up, he, that's layer one. That's the physical. Compare him to copper cable, fiber optic, uh, Wi-Fi, those things. So he, took, he sent that letter, put it in his mailbag, dropped it in his truck, and he took it to the post office. What is the post office going to do with it? Well, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to look at the zip code, the zone improvement plan code zip. And what they're going to see is that, you know what? No, I mean, this is interesting. 23606 is the source zip code and 23606 is the destination zip code. You know what that means? This is a local letter. This is, I can just send this right back out. And, he, and they do. They send it right back out to my grandmother because the zip codes were the same. And we do the same thing when we're routing with IP where we look at IP addresses and they know that, oh, the software says that this IP address is within my range of IP addresses, so it must be a computer that's on my local network. And it goes in to the switch and goes right back out. So that's how my grandmother got her letter. And it was all done, like I said, kind of with the post office representing layer two. And layer two is a switch, uh, part of the switching, to where it came up, switched, and went right back out. The same network. Okay, everything's going good. So that is analogous to a local area network because it left my house, went to the local post office, and went to my grandmother's house. So, guess what happened? My grandmother moved. She went to California. Yep, going back to Cali. Going back to Cali. She went to California. Now, I still love my grandmother, so I still want to write her letters occasionally. So I do what I always do, and I write a letter, and I send it to the post office, 
the post office, my local post office, do what they always do. They check the zip code. And they went, whoa, wait a minute. The source zip code is 23606. The destination zip code is 90210. Hmm, this is not a zip code that's in my local domain or my local network. So now what do we have to do? Well, our post office packages that letter up with a lot of other letters and they send it to a hub, let's say in St. Louis. When that letter gets to St. Louis, St. Louis looks at the zip code and goes, oh, 90210. I know where that, how to get it there. I'm going to send it to San Bernardino. San Bernardino looks at it and says, hey, I recognize this. And they know the address because this is on their local network now. And so they put it in a truck and they send it to my grandmother. So you see how it kind of had, now had to take a different path. Well, that path had to go through a layer three device, which was the St. Louis hub. So that was the layer three, because what the, at layer three, it had to be routed. So St. Louis routed that letter from Virginia all the way to San Bernardino and then to my grandmother. So that's what a layer three device, like a router does. It knows the correct path to send data, like the email that, we, that I made earlier. It knows the correct path to send that to get it to where it needs to go the most efficient and most cost-effective way. And when I say cost-effective with networking, uh, we're not talking about from a dollar and cents, but how many hops, how many different other routers it has to hit before it gets to where it needs to go. So as you see what I have here, I have two lands. This is my grandmother's local area network, and this is my local area network uh, in Virginia. So what this router does in the middle it connects disparate lands together or two sub networks that's what that router does connects those together okay so we talk about layer one layer two and layer three now part of making that work is built on something we call encapsulation and decapsulation well when, I, when this process started right i, I had a letter. I wrote the letter on a piece of paper. I took the piece of paper, folded it up, and I put it on an envelope. So I have paper uh, in an envelope. It was encapsulated in an envelope. I licked it, I licked both sides, sealed it, and I gave it to the mailman. The mailman took it, put it in his bag with a lot of other letters. So he encapsulated my envelope in a bag with other envelopes. When that bag got to uh, the, the um, post office, the post office sent it to a larger post office where they took that bag with probably many other bags and they put it on a pallet. They encapsulated. So now what do I have? I have a pallet with bags that are encapsulated and inside of the bags there are envelopes and inside of the envelopes, my envelope is the letter. So you see how everything is encapsulated. And then it got on the plane and it flew, went across to where it needs to get to, got to, got to the distant end, got to... Um, San Bernardino and the opposite happened. They broke the pallet down, took the bags out. Once the bags were out, they pulled out the letter, took it to my grandmother. My grandmother opened the letter and uh, opened the envelope, I'm sorry, and pulled the letter out. D encapsulation. So we started where it was encapsulated, encapsulation, encapsulation, and we got to a point, boom, D encapsulation, where it it came apart. Makes sense in the mail system? Well, it also makes sense in the, in the network environment. So, how does it work in that environment? Let's say you want to send your friend, you know, the keyboard cat video. Why you would ever want to do that, I don't know, except you just really didn't like your friend that well and wanted to waste their bandwidth and time. But anyway, so the first five, those upper layers, uh, the presentation, uh, the app, sorry, application, presentation, session layer, like I said, all of those things, you know, that's, we're going to assume that they were already in place, you know, and all those things happened. Well, as it moved down to the next layer, layer four, which was uh, transport, TCP or transmission control protocol, it put a header on that letter. Just like, okay, think about this. In the, in the previous example uh, with the mail, 
when they, because I, I, I addressed the envelope, which was a header. Think about that. That's, you know, now, the mail carrier takes that envelope, puts it in a bag with other letters, and what do they put on the outside of that bag? They put a tag, right, or a header. That bag goes onto a pallet that's going to go on an airplane. Well, guess what goes on the outside of that pallet? You got it. Another header or, an, or a label. So now this is what happens as your information is going up and down this, this I, we'll go to IP, the network stack. So now when it gets to layer three, um, uh, that's where we put the IP header, okay, which is at the network layer. So we have a transport layer header, and you see your actual uh, application, I mean the video is still there, we got the application layer header, it goes to the next layer down, the video is still there, application layer, and we put another header on top of that, the video is still there, and you see the same thing happens, we keep putting headers on top of headers. And then when we get to uh, the next layer, layer two, same thing. And here we put an Ethernet header, because that's the protocol. And each of these, if you think about it, these are protocols. And that was the protocol that was used at that layer. Now, from that point, it's ready to be sent out across the media that we're working with, whether it's fiber optic or whatever. But that's data encapsulation. And if we go the opposite direction, when that, okay, you just sent the, the, the cat video out, they get it. The opposite happens. It came in across the wire, across the fiber. Uh, th then when it gets to layer two, the ethernet header is stripped off. Your computer does all these things between the computer and the routing and switching equipment in your home network. It strips off that layer and sends it up the stack. Uh, the IP gets it, does what it needs to do, strips off that header, sends it up the stack. It gets to layer four, TCP, says, okay, I recognize it, strips off that header, sends it up, at that point, it looks at it, so oh, this is a video. Yes, I recognize it. It's a .mp4. Sends it up. So now, goes to your application layer, and at that layer, it sends a, a uh, API that says, okay, I got a video. Let me open up QuickTime, if I'm using a, a Mac, or let me open up Movie Maker, or Windows Movie, but I can't remember the name of the latest one. But that's, now you're ready to watch the video. Or if it's just a link, it'll just open up HTTP and send you to YouTube. So that's how that encapsulation works up and down the stack. Now, we've talked about the OSI model, you know, the Open System Interconnection Model. But there's actually a second model that's used quite a bit. And this is a much simpler model. It's called the TCP IP model. And what it does, it has four layers instead of seven. So what we do, we map uh, the seven layer model to the four layer model. For instance, the first three layers of the seven layer model is one layer in the TCP IP model. So layer five, six, and seven all maps to the application layer. The transport layer, layer four, it maps straight across, as well as layer three, your network layer, but here we call it the internet layer. And the last two layers, layer one, layer two, same thing, they map together to what we call the link layer in the TCP IP model. So actually you may see this model because it is much simpler, much easier to explain because a lot of things that go on here, these are very uh, close knit and sometimes you, is, they're hard to distinguish, hard to pull apart. A lot of things we do in the network is really kind of encapsulated in these last three uh, layers, uh, and which makes the TCP IP model a little easier to work with. Unfortunately, uh, because there's not a standardization body you may see different variants of this model. This right here has, was standardized, um, I think ANSI, or one of the professional uh, standardization organizations actually standardized this. So th this is gonna look the same no matter where you go. TC, I mean, the OSI model is always the same. You may see different names. Actually, there are some of these that have five layers instead of four. So there isn't as much standardization from that perspective with the TCP IP model. Now, last thing we'll talk about now, so we've gone up and down the stack, is topology. Is that now, how do we, you know, kind of when we were talking about at layer three, that it knows how to send information, but, and that's based on how our networks are put together. There's different topologies. There's about six topologies I'm going to come and, uh, run through here real quickly. One is to call a bus. When we first start doing networking, this is how 
a lot of our networks were put together. You had one cable, and that was a coax at the time, uh, cable that connected all of these computers together in a bus. Um, and if the that one cable broke here, the rest of these three were dead. Uh, so that was actually that was pretty early on. But there are still applications, believe it, that still use this bus. As a matter of fact, our, our um, military, um, Air Force, like you know, uh, prior Air Force, and we still use this on a lot of our aircraft. It's called a 1553 bus that we use to carry information back and forth between the cockpit and the weapon systems and other information systems on the aircraft as a bus. Another uh, topology that we use is the ring. Ring is similar to a bus, except that now we just kind of took it and wrapped it around. One of the things we always had to do when we set, up, we set up a bus network, you had to terminate it. You had to put like a 50 ohm terminator at the, right there on the end of that cable. Otherwise, it would not, uh, it would not work. So a ring, every, similar to a bus, they're all connected, but now everything moves around in a ring. And how does each computer know when to send things? It's by what we call a token. Uh, you may hear this called token ring sometimes. Uh, because each um, the, the the networking protocol that operates this ring, it gives each computer an opportunity to grab the token. It's kind of like the game used to play that you can only talk, you know, when you have the talking stick. You know, here you so you have the stick. Now you can talk. Now give the next person a stick in the group, and you can talk. Very similar. That you had the computer had to have the token before it could send information. And then the token went to here. It kept the token just kept traveling around this ring. And if, some, if a computer had to say something, it would try to reach out and grab the token when it came around. So that's how the ring worked. Uh, the star. Now this is probably one of the more common uh, topologies that you see now. And really, in your home, um, you probably have a topology that looked very similar to one of these. Uh, but the star topology, like I say, you have a networking your device here in the center, like a, a switch or a router, and all of your, de your devices are connected into that device. So like I say, very much like your home network at home, uh, where everything is connected in to your, to your wireless routing switching device. Now the network that's used similar, similarly is a uh, point to multipoint. Point to multipoint means that this one can actually send information. Now these are kind of limited in what they can do coming back to the to the, to the point to the multi point. <clears throat> uh, some of the newer technologies that are out there is the uh, mesh partial mesh. Now the great thing about a mesh network is that if you look, you see every node, every computer over here is connected directly to every other one. So for instance, this, this computer has three connections. It connects, uh, I mean four, I'm sorry. It connects here, it connects there, it connects to this one, it connects to this one. So now, and, and every one around this mesh is connected. What this provides you is outstanding redundancy. So meaning that, you know, th there's always a path for a computer to talk to another computer. So you get great redundancy. Draw back to this one, it is expensive. Think about how much cabling, how much wiring, how many, how much hardware you need, how many uh, network interface cards you need to be able to, to bring this together. But th there are utilizations for these, actually again, kind of a military uh, utilization where we use this, is in what we call swarming, uh, where we've got now uh, um, the, the, the small UAVs, uh, the, the drones, the small ones, um, like I said, where now we've got m several of these flying together in formations and they're all talking to each other through a mesh network. A another variant of this is what we call the partial mesh. Partial mesh, as you see, they're not all connected uh, together, but you do have redundancy at, s at critical points or at critical nodes within, the, within your network, okay? All right, man, we covered a lot of stuff today, didn't we? Yeah, we talked about OSI models. We talked about, uh, we gave you the analogy of UPS, and we covered network topologies. A lot of information on, on networking and switching and routing, and there's still a lot, lot more that we could cover, but we're not. We're going to stop it right here. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. God bless.